Let me tell you about one of the craziest feelings in the stock market, okay? One of those feelings is when you are buying stocks and every single time you buy a stock a few days later, a week later, the stock price is lower and then you buy more and it goes lower and then you buy more and it goes lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and you're like, what am I doing? Why didn't I just keep all my money in the bank? Yeah, that's the story of, uh, I would say, my life in the stock market in 2022 up until recently. In this video, I want to share with you guys exactly why I went the closest thing to all in the market in the month of June that I've honestly been ever in my YouTube history and why I invest it like a maniac, I would guess I would put it that way, okay? And uh, we're gonna discuss all that. Also, we're gonna discuss in this video, like what my plans are now. Am I stopping buying? Am I gonna keep buying? Um, I'm gonna share my perspective on that as well, okay? And like I said, when you are just buying, 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 and you just <laughs> your stocks literally just go lower day after day after day, week after week, it is a, it is, it, it's not a good feeling. I would just call it that. And you understand you're, you're making the wise decision that's going to help you for the long term. But in that short term time frame, it doesn't feel good. It's similar to like, if you ever, I don't know how many of you guys are like athletes or, you know, took, took, uh, you know, athletics super serious and like, you know, gave it your all and how hard like the workouts could be, right? It doesn't feel good, but you understand you're working for something that's much bigger than what's going on in that particular day. And so you kind of feel like, uh, not so smart. Let's just put it that way. And that's why everybody looks at these past time periods. Everybody looks at every single time the stock market crashed. And when I say crash, I'm usually talking about like the indexes go down at least 25%, but usually like 30% plus, you know, specifically NASDAQ, because that's so important nowadays. People look at back, back at time and say, oh man, if I was around back then, I would have been buying the dip. I would have been buying so many stocks. I would have been loading the boat. And uh, then you get to actual crashes and you actually find that very few people are buying. And it's actually a very, very, very small percentage of the US population and the worldwide population actually buys stocks during an actual market crash. And everybody says, oh, I wish. I wish I was buying, but when the time actually comes, there's very few buyers, very few. I'm talking like less than probably 1% of the population is out there actively buying stocks and excited to buy stocks in a crashing market. It's much easier, like many things in life, much easier said than done. Because when you keep putting in that money and you watch that money burn and burn and burn, and you know you put a thousand bucks in this stock and now it's worth 700 bucks and 600 bucks and 500 bucks, Woo! That's when you find out who the real investors are and who are the folks that are just, uh, you know, saying stuff. Let's just call it that, okay? So where would I actually start out today's video? This was very important, and this just came out here uh, in the past day or two. Fundstrat actually brought this out to everybody's attention, and basically what they showed it was actually showed in the uh, Volcker bear market, right? Which lasted quite a significant amount of time here. And the market pulled down pretty dang fast, right? Well, I don't want to say pretty dang fast, but it pulled down a lot over a given period of time, roughly, right? About maybe a year and a half there. That entire downward trend was erased in a four-month span. And what I want to show you here to start out this video is... When you get these big market downturns and you know stocks tanking, the market tanking, the comeback many times is pretty darn dramatic, even in some of the worst crashes we've seen. And I'm going to show you a few here. That's just one of, of many crashes over time. And uh, like I said, I want to give Fundstrat a shout out for that one for showing us this one. Okay, I want to pull you up this one right here. This was the 2020 crash, right? It took us from the bottom to get back to all-time highs uh, in the NASDAQ, I wanna look at the NASDAQ for all these, it took us 10 months, 10 months to get back. Now, keep in mind, in that crash, there was still a very, very scary time throughout that time, right? But as time went on and you got into April of 2020, May of 2020, June of 2020, so on and so forth, more and more people realized, oh, you know, the economy is not necessarily fully shut down. 
businesses are still going to be able to make money. And then all of a sudden the stimulus money started coming. People realized, oh man, a company's earnings could actually start trending up in the back half of this year. And we could end up actually being in a good position for 2021. And everybody had already freaked out and sold stocks left and right. Like if you guys were in the market in 2020, you know, I'm talking about early 2020, you remember the moves down. I mean, it was day after day stocks were down, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20%, just boom, boom, boom. Uh, amount of stocks that were falling 50, 60, 70% in weeks. Like that's how fast it was happening because everybody was absolutely freaking out and everybody thought like the economy was going to be shut down. People were talking about all these companies were going to go bankrupt and uh, it was an ugly time. But as people realize, oh, you know, it's not the end of the world. We're going to make it through this as we make it through everything, right? And uh, next thing you know, 10 months later, the stock market, the NASDAQ is back at all time highs. If we go back to the great financial crisis, which was a massive deep recession, the end of the world for the economic system where you had investment banks going under, the list of banks that went under in the great financial crisis is off the charts. The scariest financial time we've probably ever had in terms of how deep and how long it lasted. The scariest time in recent history was probably the 2020 crash, right? But that was only really scary for about a month or two because everybody was like, oh my gosh, what is this thing? What is this Rona thing? How many people is it going to take out? Like, you know, it was, that was panic. This was just devastation over several years, right? And so the NASDAQ ended up dropping peak to trough over 50% right? And we had a colossal deep recession where unemployment went to like 10%. Uh, the economy was in a mess for a long time. Well, even in that disaster, from the time the market bottomed to the time it got back to all-time highs, it actually only took two years for the NASDAQ to get back to all-time highs, which is kind of surprising to think that, right? Because of how deep and how long lasting that recession was for it to only take two years is actually pretty darn mess, uh, amazing. And especially when you consider the market fell over 50%, the Nasdaq dropped over 50% in that situation, right? Pretty darn wild. In late 2018, we had a big market pull down. It was ugly, man. And I was in that market as you know, pretty much all these markets other than the one in the eighties. Uh, I, I, you know, that was painful. I lost a lot of money very, very quickly in that, uh, I call it the December 2018 crash. And it was just, well, we crashed. And uh, I think the, the bottom, the NASDAQ was down something like 27% or something peak to trough. And so in that whole scenario, it wasn't the end of the world. And four months later, uh, we had gotten back to all-time highs and the NASDAQ, right? So what you're finding is usually you don't have to wait like five, 10 years to get back to all-time highs or anything even close to that in almost any normal scenario. The tech bubble was its own kind of thing. And I would describe that as more of a, a similar thing that's kind of gone on in the crypto market where people are really excited and, uh, you know, everybody was just way early days in that whole scenario, right? And that's kind of like the crypto market nowadays where everybody gets so excited and got so excited about the crypto market, but it's so early days there that you still got to feel, you know, you still got to figure out over the coming years, like who's going to be the real players, who's going to be long lasting. You can't compare the companies in the NASDAQ nowadays to the companies in the NASDAQ in the, in the tech bubble days. That's just a joke. It's just disrespectful uh, to even try to compare those companies. And you look at these companies nowadays, look at Amazon nowadays versus back in the tech bubble, look at Apple nowadays versus Versus in the tech bubble. Look at uh, Google McDougal. Well, they might not even have been around back then, but you look at every single company, they make what they were in the tech bubble look like a complete joke. They're, it's not even the same level, but people were so excited back then, right? So that was a whole different kind of market scenario. And it reminds me similar to like, you know, if you ever get in the pool or you're at, you know, people usually don't just jump in the pool. And if you do, you're crazy. Okay. Most people, how they usually get in the pool is they like, you know, they go in the step, they take one step in, ooh, kind of feel the water out, take another step in. Okay. Take another step in. And then they kind of get their body wet. Right. And then they kind of dunk their head a little bit. It's like a process. And in the stock market, after you come through one of these massive sell-offs in the market, it's like getting in, a, getting in a pool. Like people kind of take it step by step by step. They don't want to go too much too fast. They want to make sure the kind of the coast is clear. That's what they call it, right? Things are kind of getting better. And as they get more comfortable, as somebody gets in a pool and gets more comfortable, then uh, they start to have a little more fun, right? And they start to get more and more involved in it. And in the stock market, this happens time and time again, where you have only a, a select few that are really buying stocks heavy when, when everything's crashing, right? Then things kind of end up bottoming. You start running out of sellers, right? And you start having a little bit of buying pressure come in that 
that creates this initial spike. Then people kind of see what's going on. You get a little, a few more people come in. You already got the sellers out. So now you kind of are in this situation where you only have, you know, you're going to have much more buying pressure than selling pressure now at this point in time, right? Because all the main sellers have already got out of these stocks. And the more buying pressure on the upside starts to create, the more people start to feel comfortable. Okay, it's not the end of the world. Okay, they start getting more back in the market, back in the market, right? And it just kind of builds on itself over and over and over again until eventually, uh, you know, you, you pretty much you know, start running out of buying pressure and then you, the selling pressure takes back over again. You start having a big dip in the market again. This is something that I've shown for many, many months on the channel and we've tracked this. And this is one of the reasons I've invested so dang heavy into the market, right? Is the valuations are at historically unbelievably low levels, especially for mid caps and small caps. And most of where I put my money over the past, I would say six to nine months has been small caps and mid caps. I have bought some large caps, like uh, obviously PayPal dipped huge. So I bought some PayPal over the last few months. Uh, Meta's dipped huge. So I bought some Meta over the past few months. Netflix dipped massively. I, I don't want to even call these dips. They crashed. And so even Netflix, I bought some Netflix stock, uh, you know, uh, a couple months ago. So you know, this is a situation where I've even bought large caps, but most of my money has gone into these sorts of stocks because at the end of the day, and by the way, the valuations have started to come up. They're still insanely low for mids and smalls. But at the end of the day, this is not sustainable for the long term. You can maybe get a few months of this, but you, this is not long term sustainable. We are not going to trade at S&P 600 uh, small caps at a forward P of 12 forever. I can promise you that. We're not going to trade at mid caps of uh, a 12 forward P forever. This just doesn't happen. And if you look at history, this is not normal. This will not stay. And we will get into a normal range of 16, 17, 18 over the coming years. And so I've looked at this and I'm like, this is one of the very few opportunities we've ever seen where you can get these sorts of stocks for this cheap of valuations, right? And the only other time periods you can really find this is in that, that crazy downward crash we had in March of 2020, right? And in 2008, 2009 crash. And outside of that, you can't find time periods where these stocks have traded this cheap. So I'm going to continue, you know, obviously to have just bought these stocks left and right, right? And you know, when you're in this sort of market, it kind of reminds me because people are looking for like, when's the end, right? And I, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And, uh, you know, September, you, you, you just want the summer to break, man. But the summer, you still like the average high is like 100 degrees. You go out in September and it's like 105 out, 110. You're like, can fall time just come here? I'm sick and tired of this heat, right? And that's the way that kind of the stock market works where, where when you're in one of these kind of vicious crashes, people are like, when's the end coming? Like, is this thing ever going to be over, right? And they start to just kind of lose faith and stocks trade at some just insane discounts and some, some, some pricing that you just never see when it comes to price to sales ratios, forward P's and things like that. And the only time you've ever seen them trade like that is in other massive crashes before, right? Large caps, same exact situation. Large caps have fallen dramatically, not as not nearly as much as mids and smalls. And that's why mids and smalls, in my opinion, represent the most value. And I think those would be the stocks you'll make the most money in over the next, let's just call it three years or so. But when it comes to large caps, we've come way down now. And uh, you know, we, we've come up a little bit since the market bottom there. But I mean, look at the lows there. I mean, you're talking about lower values and back, you have to go back to like 2014, 2013, right? And then obviously the March 2020 crash, we were below Below that and then the uh, December 2018 crash we were lower than that but yeah very few and far between you can get large caps for even th those sorts of values right now next up here on why I went so dang heavy in the market was the market just got over overly pessimistic in my personal opinion you know if we look at the AI investor sentiment which tracks how investors are feeling the stock market is going to do over the next six months I mean check this out from April through June, essentially, seven out of the 13 weeks, we were under 20%. Under 20% of investors bullish on the market, seven out of 13 weeks. That's, to everybody that doesn't really track this on, like that's ridiculous, okay? That almost never, ever happens. To ever see the bullish ratio at less than 20% of investors are bullish on the market for the next six months, that's a ridiculously low number. And the only time, you, there's very few times you could ever find us basically having, you know, less than 20% of investors bullish on the market. But never mind that, you could almost never find a time period where we had seven out of 13 weeks where 
20%, uh, less than 20% of investors were bullish. I couldn't find another time period where seven out of 13 weeks were like that. And if you do find anything like that, it will only be in another massive crash. That almost never happens, right? You know what else never happens? This sort of bearishness in the market. I mean, look at this. April 27th, almost 60% of investors were bearish on the market, right? June 15th, week ending, 58.3% of, inve of investors bearish on the market the next six months. Look at this. This is right around the, the time the market bottomed somewhere in these weeks here, okay? June 22nd, 59.3% of investors bearish on the market the next six months. These numbers are ridiculous. That is not sustainable. That will not last. And at the end of the day, this has to come to a conclusion. And uh, eventually, all of these crazy amounts of bearish people start to move over to the neutral side, and the neutral side starts to move over to the bullish side. That's what happens, okay? That's another reason why I invest so heavy in the market. If we go back to 2009, look at this. We're, we're more bearish on the market. Their investors were more bearish on the market in June of 2022 than they were in 2009. Think about that for a moment. I mean, look at this. You know, at least then you were at consistently like 20 something percent of uh, investors were, were bullish on the market, right? You only had one week there where you were under 20%. I mean, think about that for a moment. This is when the economy was crashing, investment banks were going down left and right, people were losing jobs like insane, and the market was more bullish then than in June of 2022. Isn't that something else, right? Also, keep this in mind, right? Look at this. So March 5th, 2009, the biggest amount that I could ever find in history of the AI inv investor sentiment, which goes all the way back to the 80s, the biggest number I could ever find that was bearish was this number here, 70.27%. If you could ever find a week that was more bearish than that, let me know. But that's the most bearish week I've ever seen for that sentiment. And guess what? That's where the market bottomed. Literally, you can't make this stuff up. It's incredible. When everybody gets overwhelmingly bearish on the market and no one's bullish, it usually means a, a flip is coming, okay? Now, you know, in terms of trying to call a bottom on the market, a bottom on stocks, it's like flipping a dang coin, but I think it's even harder than flipping a coin. You have two types of investors in the market. You have the investors that are experienced enough and intelligent enough to understand they cannot call the bottom in the market. They can't call the bottom in stocks. And you got the other folks that haven't been around long enough and uh, maybe think a little too highly of themselves that they think they can call the bottom, okay? At the end of the day, I know I can't call the bottom in the market. I can't call the bottom in stocks. I could guess. It's just a guess, okay? But the fact is, like, no one knows when the stock market's going to bottom, when stocks going to bottom. So the, the bottom line, I look at all these different metrics and all these different things, and I say, I've got to buy, buy, buy. And if I see great deals out there, I buy and I pick up those stocks for what I feel is a great deal, right? Because I know there's no way I'm going to be able to time. I wish... I wish I knew exactly, oh, the market's going to bottom on this day at this price and boom, I'm going all in that day. I wish I knew that. The fact is I don't know that. No one knows that unless I think a little too highly of themselves, okay? No. in terms of me moving forward, uh, I started to cash up a little bit. So I broke my, uh, th there's a big rule I always preach, which is basically staying 10 to 30% cash, okay? At all times, cash and cash equivalents. And you get down to 10% when you're investing very heavily into the market, right? And it, you go through certain time periods in the market where you're, you're having trouble finding deals in the market. And that's when you get up to like 30% cash. But usually if you're, uh, you know, let's call it, you have more than 30% cash, that's just a situation where you're probably playing a little too scared, right? I broke my own rule in the month of June and for most of this year, actually. I went under 10% cash. And I do not like breaking my own rules, especially when it's an important one like that. But I felt I had a, an extraordinary opportunity. So I flushed a lot of money out there. Now, as of today, I can say I am over 10% cash as of right now. So I'm back into my normal range. And I hope to be able to cash up here for a little bit and catch my breath at least. Because it has been a onslaught of me investing in the front half of, of 2022 as the market just crashed and crashed and crashed and I just flooded money in the market and do, 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 right? I'm hoping to catch my breath for a bit, okay? That's what I'm personally hoping for and also put myself in a position that in case we get the next shoe to drop, as they say, right? And you get another big drop in the market, at least I have some, some capital around to take advantage of that if that does happen. The main thing I'm personally worried about is the real estate market because so many jobs are directly and indirectly impacted from real estate and real estate is just getting worse and worse and worse for the past several months. And I don't know if that's gonna get better in the short term. Mortgage rates have come down a bit here over the past few weeks, that's good news, but I don't know if that's enough. 
And so real estate's the, the biggest thing I'm personally worried about. I'm actually more worried about real estate than, than inflation or anything. This is the main thing I'm concerned with because I don't think people understand how important the real estate industry is for the U.S. economy and for companies' earnings and the overall feeling of confidence for consumers. It is vital. Okay, it's absolutely vital. So that's the one thing that I'm personally a little concerned with. Okay, so. And that's why I went super heavy into the market, guys. Hope you enjoyed this. As always, if you're looking to join me in my private stock group and learn how to value a stock, if they're overvalued, undervalued, fairly, fairly valued, if you want to learn financial statements like a CPA would, if you want to get access to the Dividend Investing Mastery course, the Becoming Master of the Stock Market course, the Thriving in a Recession courses, and get access to the private Discord chat with the six and seven figure members, then you can go ahead and check out pinned comment down there. Apply to join us in the private stock group. Much love as always, and have a great day.